Op 3 mei 2019 kwam Edith Eva Eker op uitnodiging van de School voor Transitie, het expertisecentrum Omgaan met Verlies en publicatiebureau In de Wolken naar Nederland voor een unieke masterclass rondom haar wereldwijde bestseller De Keuze. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Dr. Edith Eva Eger to the stage. And um, you know that she's being called the uh, ballerina of Auschwitz. And that is not just a name, that is because she likes dancing. This book is all about putting into words things that can barely be put into words. Um, and my question for you would be, doesn't it look beautiful, by the way, in Dutch? Beautiful. Yeah. Say it again. De keuze. De keuze. De keuze. Leven in vrijheid. It's very, very German. It's lovely. It's, it's very Dutch. <laughs> it's very Dutch. <laughs> yes. Well... It's very Dutch indeed. <laughs> But, It's good um, to be Dutch. Fair play to our lovely you're neighbors. Good people. They're, they're, yes, and so are the Germans. Um, I, I, I really like a man to have kindness and integrity. Ah. I don't think you can really love a person who you don't respect. How, how, how was that, that with you and your father? How, what do you recall as like lessons from your father? My, my father wanted a son after two girls. And he told me that he slammed the door when he found out it's a girl again. But then my mother took me to a ballet school and I became a gymnast. And my father looked at me and said, when you grow up, You're going to be the best dressed girl in town. And he told me that my mother keeps reminding him that she married down because he was only a tailor. Mm. So my father became a couturier, and Papa watched me, <laughs> watched me fly. I, I dress well. And I know that my My dad would be so proud that I'm here with you mm. to talk about this book and to let people know what happens when good people do bad things. So, Edie? People are good. We're born yeah. with love and joy and preciousness. And that's what I came here to celebrate. And I'm very proud of my ancestors as you are too, because one thing is wonderful that you and I have in common, uh, that our ancestors didn't have it as good as we do, and they never gave up. They never gave up. Never gave up. It's easier to die than to live. So why this book, and why now? <laughs> You're so young, so why should you write a book already <laughs> at such a young age? I think you have to be old to be young, 
Let's get that clear. Uh, and you know why I'm so young today? Because I gave myself permission to give up a need for approval of others. That I don't have to perform and have an image of me that I'm portraying here. I am off stage the same, I am on stage. And that's a great feeling when you give up that ego, that false self, and also give up the need to please everybody. And how did you learn to do that? I learned how to meet people where they are, but treat them the way I would like them to be. My uh, definition of love is, I don't want to throw this down, okay. but my definition of love is the ability to let go. Okay. Let go. Let go of the need for approval. Let go of the need for perfectionism. So, and and what, what I was hearing you saying is that you saw your sister hungry. Yes. And there was something in, your, in yourself that decided to also at least focus on the hunger of your sister rather than just on the hunger of yourself. Exactly. If you're, you, if you're just for the me, 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 you didn't make it. We had to commit ourselves and form a family of the inmates. Cooperation was the name of the game, not competition, not domination. And all we had was each other then, and guess what? All we have is each other now. And so I'm very happy for my age now because I'm free. I came here, hopefully I feel good afterwards because it's not what we do, it's how we feel afterwards. Because after all, maybe life is just one day. That morning sunshine is not coming back. So I'm in the evening time of my life, and I do ask myself, how do I want to be remembered? What did you receive in Auschwitz to come to the place where you are right now? I think Auschwitz, as anything in life, is an opportunity to choose whether I'm going to give up. You know, Hans Selye, who got the Nobel Prize in the stress studies, tells us that anything stressful that comes to us, we have two automatic responses, fight or flee. He got the Nobel Prize for that. In Auschwitz, I could not fight because if I would have touched the guards, and many did, and they were shot right in front of me, I could not flee because if I would have touched the barbed wires, I would have been electrocuted and I saw the blue bodies. So I was able to somehow, in some way, find a way how to look at the discomfort and make something out of it that I can say, I don't like it, it's inconvenient, and I didn't say yes, but. I said yes, and it's temporary, and yes, I can survive it, and yes, if I survive one day, tomorrow I'll be free. So what was a moment for you when you knew you had to start talking about it? I began to work with Vietnam veterans. I was actually one of the first ones who talked about post-traumatic PTSD. Mm. Unfortunately, we pathologize too much. I think it's important to say that when someone comes back from an experience, we must not talk about pathology, like disorder. It's not a disorder. It's about post-traumatic uh, grief. And grief is not an illness. 
because we grieve over not what happened, but what didn't happen. For example, my granddaughter was born, Lindsay Catherine, and the pediatrician said, this little girl is very flexible, she might become a ballerina. And I said, that's the best revenge to Hitler. Now I have three generations, I can die. And guess what? She did become a little ballerina. <laughs> and when she went to Bishop School, a beautiful school in La Jolla, California, and uh, she asked me to buy her a dress. And I'm a big sucker, I buy the best of the best. <laughs> and I come home, and I like to talk about the word understand. You know, that's so up here. I didn't understand, I started to cry. It just didn't go together. I'm buying a dress, Lindsay goes to the dance, and I'm coming home and started to cry. And I came to the realization that I'm not crying because Lindsay went to her dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. I, I have a God that I discovered in Auschwitz, guide. A guide who was able to guide me from hatred to pity. So at the age of 16, I was able to look at the guards with pity. I'm still feeling so sorry for him because he was a beautiful, precious love of God. God is good, creates good, good, precious, joyful, loving babies. And then we learn to hate. And I felt so sorry for them wearing that uniform, throwing children to the ovens without gassing them. And I prayed. And I think that gave me the freedom of knowing I cannot change what's outside of me. I could not control the externals. They beat me, I tortured, they, they could throw me in the gas chamber any minute, but they could never murder my spirit, and that's what I bring you today. That spirit, when it never dies, that's what I bring you, that's what it does. How does one learn, how does one make a choice to yeah. cherish the wound? How, how does one do that? How do you do that? I wanted to live so badly, and I think God gave us that opportunity. I think we possess that, to be able to have that will to live, that tremendous uh, desire to make it no matter what. I never ever imagined myself in Auschwitz that I'm gonna stay there. So when what? I get out of here, when I get out of here, and I'm here to tell you about it. So it works. <laughs> it works. How did you learn to forgive people such as Mengele? Mengele. I, I don't look at myself as a person who has any godly powers to forgive the Nazis. I leave that up to God. But what I do, I want to do everything that is humanly possible to unite, to empower each other with our differences. That you don't have to be like me, I don't have to be like you, but I'm just one of a kind there never ever be another you. And I'm gonna be very satisfied in my deathbed. Mm. I was very ill a year ago, mm. I almost died. Mm. And I wrote my other daughter, uh, Marianne, I want to die dash happy. And I know I'm gonna say in my deathbed that I'm grateful I'm grateful that I've gotten this far and not asking why was I in Auschwitz. 
I would say I'm grateful that I was able to not only survive, but guide others also to be survivors and not to ask why me, but what now. And that's what you're doing here. So I am your cheerleader. I'm your cheerleader. Well. And I hope you're gonna become your own cheerleader and recognize that as a human being, you're limited. You're limited. I do what's humanly possible, and then I hand it over to God. There. All right. <laughs>